our first speaker is David Young, lecturer in biochemistry and molecular bioscience, University of Northampton, with his presentation on sepsis, a global killer. Thank you, Elena. I'll make a start. Um, thank you everybody for having me. Uh, my name is David Young. I'm a lecturer at the University of Northampton, so I'm program leader for the new biochemistry degree um, that we have here. And I'm also a researcher at Northampton General Hospital. So I work quite closely with inten the intensive care unit and um, the high dependency unit. Um, been working on COVID, shockingly, um, for the last year, um, but now looking forward to getting back to sepsis um, and autoimmunity research. So um, this presentation, um, I'm, apologies if I go a bit quick throughout this, um, I've got quite a lot I want to squeeze in. Everybody at the RSB knows once I start talking about sepsis, I very rarely stop unless I'm stopped. Um, so we'll just kind of go over what sepsis is. We'll have a look at some statistics um, and just some of the key molecules at play and how we kind of deal with it. So what actually is sepsis? It's an autoimmune disease. Um, so autoimmune disease, meaning that your own immune system, typically the innate system, um, attacks itself. It becomes hyperactive and it can no longer differentiate between uh, host cells and foreign cells. So pathogens, for example. Um, so all it does is basically attack everything in the vicinity, which means an infection that would typically be localized can then become systemic. Um, and then you have greater issues. So it's a very um, autoimmune, immune response regulated disease. There are various means of initiation. So there is no one microbe, no one bacteria, viral, uh, virus or fungi that initiate um, sepsis per se. Everybody is different. Um, different infections instigate different reactions. Even blunt force trauma, um, as we'll talk about in a minute, um, can also um, trigger a, a sepsis response with your immune system. The reason why it's often referred to as a killer in the shadows of other diseases, here you can see, uh, hopefully you can see it's a bit small, um, but you can see some of the symptoms that you have. Now, this is, if we've just focus on adults for now, um, slurred speech and confusion, very typical um, symptoms of strokes, for example, um, extreme shivering and muscle pains um, often come with the flu. Um, no passing urine in a day, often issues with kidneys and things like that, um, severe breathlessness um, and discoloring of skin. All of these are symptoms that often align themselves with other diseases as well. So it's, it's quite a difficult a quite a difficult disease to kind of pinpoint in early stages, but it's really important that you get that um, early stage diagnosis and we'll kind of have a look at some stats in a bit as to why that's so important. Um, essentially, when the infection and your immune system um, attacks host cells and the pathogens, um, the, seps the, the sepsis development occurs when the localization of the infection broadens. Um, if it broadens systemically enough, you go into what's called septic shock, which is essentially when your blood pressure um, rises dramatically. Um, so you end up with high levels of serum lactate, which essentially means that you're no longer optimizing the oxygen that's going around your body. And if you don't optimize the cells, uh, we have issues with aerobic respiration and energy consumption and all of that sort of stuff. So um, we end up with malfunctioning organs. Uh, typically kidneys are the first to go um, usually. So, um, like I said, it's not necessarily one infection fits all. It can be anything. Um, and in the hospital, we usually have two different means of kind of diagnosis. We have community acquired and hospital acquired sepsis. So just really quickly, two little case studies. Uh, this guy here, this is Johnny McCarthy, a friend of mine. He, lovely guy, scouser, likes to go horse racing. Uh, he likes to watch the horses. Um, he went to a horse race event one day and he just was walking through the paddocks. They opened the big gates up and he stepped to one side to let people through and he, he bumped his knee on the side of a wooden post. Um, no blood, no bruising, no real visible trauma. Um, he kind of just, he says openly, I just thought, you know, oh, I'll feel that in the morning. Um, and that was it. Carried on with his day. The next day he wakes up 
Um, didn't feel well at all, but kind of just put it down to maybe a bit of a hangover. Um, but this lasted for two or three days. After two or three days, he went to hospital um, up in Liverpool. They didn't necessarily think it was sepsis to begin with. They kind of didn't even consider it, to be honest. Um, they sent him on his way. Within 24 hours, he was back again. Um, he remembers going back to the hospital. He was feeling really poorly, shivering, convulsing, really felt like he was going to die. Um, he woke up three months later um, in intensive care. And you can see he's in a mobility scooter now. So where the blunt force trauma occurred and inflammation occurred just below the knee, um, he had to have his leg amputated. So from literally just bumping his knee, um, he ended up losing a part of his limb. And I always, like when I talk to my students about this, um, how often do you kind of bump your hand, your knee, your, your leg, uh, your head even um, on the stairs or on a ceiling? Um, that's all he did. And, and he had this dramatic fallout. So that's one instance of community acquired sepsis. Um, apologies if I get a bit stuttery on this next bit. This next bit is a little bit close to home. So those at RSB will know. Um, this is my fiance, Rachel. Um, this is my baby, Kobe. Um, they were born in March this year. Um, Rachel had quite a traumatic labor, 37 hours long. Um, I joked at the time that she was just, you know, taking her time. Um, but it turns out the last four hours couldn't have gone worse, really, if we had tried. Rachel had a failed epidural and a failed spinal tap. Once her waters had broken, we don't know where the infection came from, but Rachel developed a, a severe infection. That infection turned, because her body was already under stress, her immune system turned on itself, could no longer differentiate what was going on. Um, Rachel went into septic shock um, within four hours. By subsequence, Rachel was in, had developed sepsis, uh, which meant unborn baby Kobe developed sepsis also. So, they got rushed to the emergency room um, and emergency caesarean occurred. When Kobe was born, um, he was born with sepsis. Um, he was limp, he was blue, and he wasn't breathing for 12 minutes. He had to be resuscitated. Um, so he has gone through a traumatic experience, um, doesn't know anything about it. Um, I just sat there crying for the duration. Um, but that is how sepsis can sneak up um, and just devastate lives completely. Now, thankfully, thankfully these three have all lived. Um, they've all lived. Mum and baby are home. They're doing fine. Uh, John, Johnny is home. He's doing fine. Um, but there are so many people in the world that do not get that second chance. Um, so that's two ways in which we kind of differentiate where sepsis has come from or developed. So moving on, um, just a couple of little statistics. Now I'm gonna just mention this 28 day turnaround. So in intensive care, we typically have this 28 day point where as soon as you are diagnosed with sepsis, you go on broad spectrum antibiotics like uh, ampicillin, uh, deoxycycline, something like that. Um, and all that is is to contain the infection to, to stop it becoming even uh, systemically greater. Um, we get you on that and then it's a case of trial and error antibiotics often um, but that takes a lot of time if you are progressing and moving towards a more healthy status by 28 days you have a 95 percent chance of um, surviving if you're not progressing by 28 days uh, and you're not receiving treatment you have a 95 percent chance of dying the swing is is that bigger turnaround which is quite scary uh, basically every three seconds uh, somewhere someone somewhere in the world dies of sepsis uh, those figures are a little bit a little bit misleading um, with regards to the bigger picture so 11 million ish lives depending on where you read uh, somewhere between 8 and 11 million lives lost a year due to sepsis related illnesses around 50 million cases the that looks really bad so 11 million um, out of 50 million so 11 out of 50 is really bad um, but in some cases with poorer um, economics and not such good health care, that figure is, is much higher. Places like the UK, uh, so we'll have a look, um, 
typically about uh, a quarter of a million cases per year. Um, and there's still a lot of cases. Um, there's still a lot of cases. For those of you that follow the news, Manchester City have been all over the news just lately. Um, so 250,000-ish cases of sepsis per year in the UK. Now, this is the Etihad Stadium on the right. Uh, the Etihad Stadium, home of Manchester City, uh, and that holds about 50,000 people. Um, just having a look at that image um, showing about 50,000 people is the same amount of people that lose their lives every year due to sepsis in the UK. I think that picture is quite, it, it just brings home the fact that this is such a serious um, illness. Um, and kills more than I think it's breast cancer, ovarian cancer uh, and colon cancer combined per year. Um, so very, very dramatic. So let's have a look at some of the molecules at play and some of the molecules that are being researched at Northampton Hospital. Um, a whole bunch of different markers used throughout the whole of the UK. Kininstombin, procalcitonin is a big one. Heat shock, depending on where in the UK you are, um, different hospitals, different clinicians see different things. Um, so they all kind of have their own um, outreach, if you like. Um, there is no central mediator. So there is no, um, if you've got a big infection, uh, if you've got a big rise in a particular molecule, that doesn't mean that you've developed sepsis. Um, tumor necrosis factor alpha is one of the big key players, but it's not the only one. Procalcitonin, sorry, is another one. But there are lots and lots of molecules at play that interact with many different pathways from complement to all sorts of stuff. Um, that get affected. So it really is, there is no single pathogen, there is no single molecule, there is no single pathway, it is just a web and everybody is slightly different, which is why it's really hard to kind of get this diagnosis. Um, it's important to remember that when you do get your infection, the kind of the first response is inflammations, we, most people know, um, but we do have, um, we do have inflammation inhibitors, so natural inflammation in inhibitors, interleukin-4 and 8, perfect examples. Um, but during sepsis, they get down-regulated, uh, which is quite interesting. So it's, it's almost like your immune system is down-regulating itself, which it thinks is doing the right thing, but actually is, is far, far from the opposite. Okay. Um, so just two molecules that I was going to have a, have a talk about today. Procalcitonin, um, so PCT, that's the precursor for calcitonin, which is a hormone, uh, part of the endocrine system. It's basically made in the thyroid, thyroid medulla. Um, but what's quite interesting about this, this molecule is you can see the pink bit in the middle. Um, this is your um, calcitonin. So this is your hormone that's released. But the precursor is procalcitonin. So you can see you've got two um, additional components here. So whilst it's in this precursor state, that can be a very good biomarker for infection. So, and typically with um, uh, a rise in immune responses. So most people, um, and this is a problem where we say most people because we kind of just get a given um, 0 0.05 nanograms per mil of PCT in a healthy person, that's standard. Um, although epigenetics, um, genetic factors like copy number variation, single nucleotide polymorphisms, they will play a role um, in the expression of procalcitonin. Uh, but we generally say that 0 0.05 nanograms per mil is in a healthy person with no um, infection. Uh, that level rises uh, when you have that local infection, uh, it rises to about 0 0.1 to 0 0.25 nanograms per mil. Um, and if you start to develop sepsis um, and, that, and that's localization graters uh, and becomes systemic, we rise PCT to two, uh, 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 nanograms per mil. And that's where we end up with our, we, we, we would then consider um, using um, broad spectrum antibiotics, okay, to contain the infection. Um, as it progresses, if 
if the infection progresses and, and the sepsis progresses, you end up in septic shock where your PCT levels raise to anything up to 10 nanograms per mil. And this is really specific um, to infection. This isn't like a C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is uh, another protein that rises with infection, um, but quite frankly, it's not that good a biomarker. I only have to cough funny and my, my CRP levels go through the roof uh, and it looks like I'm dying when I'm not. Um, uh, Calci1 gene, um, that's kind of what we're looking at at the hospital. So we are having, we are having a look at um, some types of mutations uh, in specific places found on chromosome 7p arm domain 15.2. So that's procalcitonin. That's one molecule that's at play. Uh, very briefly, we'll have a look at tumor necrosis factor alpha, um, as I'm sure we know as a primary cytokine. Um, it's interesting that there are certain variations that lead to tumor necrosis factor being implicated in different disorders. So um, a mutation, a polymorphic variant at 308A, so an alanine uh, mutation, um, that induces uh, lupus, systemic lupus, which is essentially like an arthritis. Uh, and there are different variations um, throughout. It's, it's a, a, a small protein, reasonably small protein, uh, 17 kilodaltons. Uh, it's a homo trimer, so three components. Uh, and they bind to tumor necrosis factor receptor one and two. Um, so it's got easy access and it of, often down regulates uh, gene expression. So for interleukin four and eight, as earlier stated. Um, it's produced by activated macrophages, T lymphocytes, natural killer cells, uh, and a few more other innate immune cells as well. Um, also plays a role similarly to interleukin-1b. So interleukin-1b is another cytokine that we are going to be investigating further at the hospital. I'm going to have to speed up a little bit because I've just realized how long I've been going on for. So Last thing that we're looking at from an immune perspective. So here we can see, if I just get my laser pointer. Okay, so here is a pathogen here, and you can see that we have got IgG, so immunoglobulin G, the, uh, the FAB region bound to the pathogen, making an immunocomplex. That leaves the FC portion, the fragment crystallizable portion of IgG exposed, which means it can bind to uh, macrophages or phagocytes and et cetera. They bind to FC receptors uh, and it initiates a response. So in this case, it could be uh, endocytosis. We are looking at the FC receptor family, but we're really focusing on this one here on the right. This is an activatory uh, high affinity receptor, FC gamma receptor one. Um, the rest, we're not really looking at their low affinity. Um, but what's quite interesting about this receptor is it binds specifically to the FC portion at two known histidines. And those histidines are thought to be under positive selection. So they have evolved more readily over a species over time, over the last kind of 15, 16 million years, uh, where we shared a common ancestor with orangutans. Uh, it's evolved more readily. So it begs the question, have we evolved to become um, more prone to sepsis and things like that? Um, so how do we test for sepsis? So initially, you'll have an Apache score, which is your acute physiological um, assessment score. Basically, we're just looking at a whole bunch of stuff like oxygen coming in, out, um, absorption, that sort of thing. If you are deemed and go on to becoming a sepsis patient for a period of time, you end up with a sequential organ failure assessment score, uh, which is basically where uh, the clinician will keep an eye and the nurses will keep an eye on um, organ function. Typically, ki kidneys are the first that we look at the most, um, and then uh, lungs as well um, after that. So uh, that provides obviously quite a lot of information. So for those that survive, Northampton University, ran by Rachel, actually, who's had sepsis, um, she runs a support group um, for sepsis survivors. And post-sepsis syndrome is, is, is quite a new term. Um, it's very similar to um, long COVID, if you've heard of long COVID, uh, which is basically um, all the symptoms that occur afterwards. And the physical isn't so bad compared to the psychological, where the hallucinations, nightmares, depression, memory loss, for example, 
are really, really terrible. Um, they can be really, really bad. We've got people in our group that have had hallucinations and nightmares uh, for at least two or three years after having sepsis. Um, what does the future hold? So I've just spoken about how we kind of deal with it now. Um, Apache 2 and SOFA scores, broad spectrum antibiotics, and then kind of trial and error um, on antibiotics, um, which isn't good um, when it comes to antibiotics because uh, antibiotic resistance and that sort of stuff going on at the hospital, big, 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 big problem. What does the future hold? Um, being careful of what I say, because some of our research is under an embargo. We are looking at personalized medicine. That's the new buzzword at hospitals at the moment. Um, and we're looking to develop a PCR test, um, sepsis patient portfolio. So one test, um, and it can tell us all about what um, is happening with the body. So we hopefully will eradicate the trial and error option, which means we go straight to the right antibiotic. In theory, that's what it should do. Thank you very much. Any questions? And only 27 seconds over. Amazing. So we move into our first poster, Anvesha Dash. And Anvesha, she's a student at Nottingham Trent University. And her poster is about assessment of health in poultry through pan-analytical techniques, multi-skill development of contemporary protocols. Hello everyone, um, it's Anvesha. Um, I'm a PhD student uh, from Nottingham Trent University and I'm doing my PhD under Philip Bobby Wilson with um, Scully Dawn and Emily Burton. And obviously, yes, um, Eleanor was also my mentor too. And um, so I'm presenting a short, uh, very poster about the gut health, gut health assessment. Um, in poultry industry. So I just started my uh, PhD um, this October. So it's uh, basically any, it's a uh, very much um, kind of uh, assessment process, how are we gonna do it, how are we gonna establish a method. And we're also trying to find out why it is so important. So first just look at some points like why Obviously, the poultry gut health is so important. So the poultry, obviously, it's a very big industry. And the turnover was nearly 46.3 billion in 2018, just an egg and chicken trade in the US. Um, yes, the production is uh, huge um, because, obviously, the entire world. So it's not like a staple diet. But yes, the most of the majority people who includes chicken as a source of a very basic protein. So, and we know the chickens are really easy to get uh, infected and they are having high mortality. If any kind of uh, virus, a virus outbreak or any kind of infection outbreak. So obviously when it's a huge kind of flock mortality happens, so they don't have usually any particular set method to assess what actually went wrong into the gut. And, the, and only and only the process is being now uh, previously is being using um, is just a visual uh, method. Like they just see what's going wrong with the gut. Um, they just made uh, analysis and they just write down a uh, write down a report. So Obviously, there's not any setup method or any process that been has set up what's actually infection, what kind of infection or what actually gone wrong. So um, basically, my aim of my project is to develop a multi-scale and a quantitative technique and a reliable and a very reproducible protocol to assess the gut health and actually to know what exactly and what happening. So <clears throat> my work, uh, this is my work plan, which I have, which we have obviously made uh, and set together. But this method anyway has to be changed uh, because this got really large samples to be collected and everything. So the first work package I have included, obviously this would be a controlled validation trial. So 
there will be uh, 50 birds which will be 80 weeks old and we're gonna monitor the uh, gut, gut obviously and they are also uh, developed osteoporosis so after sacrificing the birds we're gonna take the bones we're gonna use a dexa bone cutters to check the strength and obviously we're gonna collect the bloods and excreta and the digester from the entire gut and um, obviously the part of the gut tissue and we're going to assess uh, what's actually going wrong. So we're going to use the microbiology techniques to check what kind of microbiology, um, I mean, microorganisms are growing in, in the digester. And we're going to use um, NMR process. So NMR we're going to use to check the metabolites, which are present in the uh, chicken bloods, uh, which are pro we are also going to use um, the excreta samples and we're going to run through the NMR and we're going to check what kind of metabolites are present. And then after that, we're going to have another trial. And obviously, yes, we're going to have uh, control. We're going to use a younger, bar, a younger bird, which don't have any kind of osteoporosis or they have a completely healthy digester just to cross check. So what uh, if any bird is not infected or don't have any osteoporosis. So, so we can make um, the judgment based on the control. And the next trial would be obviously laying folk. We're going to take 40 brown egg layers and a 40 white egg layers. And that trial is going to be for uh, 60 weeks. And the trial will be from 20 weeks to 80 weeks. And we're going to keep one each. So one white egg uh, layers and one brown egg layers in each cage because obviously the um, trial is being staged from 20 weeks to 80 weeks and to differentiate um, between the eggs from the individual so we're going to take the excreta swapped we're going to check and we're going to differentiate how of the eggs and um, the samples we're going to collect the samples again after killing the bird we're going to do the DEXA, uh, use the DEXA cutter to check the bone strength and check the osteoporosis. And we're going to use the yolk and album in this case. And just, and we're going to run into the NMR and just to check. So if they have uh, any kind of uh, metabolite present in the very, in very early age, like when, uh, when they are in eggs form. So we're going to check uh, the uh, obviously the metabolites from the start from they going to the adult so um obviously the samples are huge which is nearly with one we have calculated is nearly 4160 samples again that has to be cut short um but that was the initial plan to start off so this project has a like a huge scope uh in the moderation uh in the poultry industry and uh, working with the key commercials, we are gonna uh, working with the policymakers. Obviously, we're gonna. It has a scope to produce um, REF and the. Um, um, sorry, I forgot the term. So it has. Um, uh, it's basically a dilution from a uh, form of uh, a systematic review. So it has a huge impact on that. Sorry, it's uh, REA guidance. So it has a scope of a producer for REA guidance um, review. And why it's so important to um, know the, what's happening with the gut because the poor gut health is poultry can lead a dramatic uh, float mortality, which could be uh, due to a great uh, financial loss as well. And the health gut is also important because um, it's depend on the feeding. So because the same uh, food we're going to have, and it's important to know what's going wrong with the chicken and what we are actually consuming. And uh, obviously, uh, the gut of a fowl is a really complex organ. So we need to set like a particular um, particular method to know and. Uh, and it's really easy. The chick, the gut uh, of the any poultry, it's really easy to get infected by the microbial organisms. It's including virus, protozoas, and uh, absolutely things. So, 
we know if we know what's going wrong so we can modify the diet the rearing environment obviously and what kind of feeding they are having so if we can control this uh met the i mean we, if you can control this uh factor so we think we can actually uh produce a better chicken health or uh, um, less osteoporosis in chickens so uh, this is what this is what i'm focusing i'm mainly focusing on to running the samples on nmr and just to know what kind of metabolites they are having and uh, main two uh, folk, my area of focus is, is is obviously NMR and the microbiology uh, part of the gut sample. So that's actually at the very beginning process. So um, I just started my, after opening the lockdown, I just started going into the university. So I started collecting my samples. So hopefully soon I'll be have much more data um, to, to support my work plan. Our next presenter is Natalie Lam, student of University of Sheffield, with her presentation on chemical-free water supply. Is chemical-free drinking water distribution a possibility in the UK? Um, so thank you very much for, for coming here today and inviting me uh, along to talk about my poster with you guys. Um, I'm really excited and it's really cool to be talking to such a diverse audience don't boo me off yet but i'm actually doing my phd in civil engineering and microbiology um so yeah bear with me because um my phd is primarily in engineering if i'm being honest okay so chemical free water is what my work is all about um, doing my phd with the university of sheffield and i'm doing it in collaboration with the water company anglian water who supply water and sewage services to the east of the uk so I'm going to take you through my poster. I'm going to go down the left hand side first, scroll all the way back up and then go down the right hand side with you. So first start, why am I doing this research? What am I, what is this chemical free water? What am I talking about? So the UK uses lots of chemicals to treat and distribute our drinking water. We've been doing this for many, many years and it really, really works. So we have really strict regulations in the UK, but we're compliant with about 99.95% of them. Um, at the customer tap and at the water treatment works. But the thing is, the use of these chemicals can have unintended consequences. And I think we're at this stage now in our water that we're kind of ready to think about the sustainability of our practices. How can we make it even, even better for future generations? It's no longer sort of firefighting anymore. It's more about looking to the future and how things can be even better. So some examples of these chemicals and the problems they can have. Um, so one example is chlorine. So chlorine is sort of used twice as part of the treatment process. So it's used once to treat the water. So for instance, you've got river water and you want to disinfect it. And then it's used again before water goes into the pipe networks. Um, so one of the problems with chlorine, and there was a really good example of this um, in South Carolina a few years ago, uh, chlorine was being transported by rail and the, the train actually derailed. Um, and for sort of a, a two meter radius, a two mile radius, all along where the train derailed um, and this chlorine gas leak happened, everything died. All plant life, um, all uh, insects, everything within that two mile radius of that chlorine gas leak died. Um, so this is of concern for these people who are working on these sites in the UK who are storing up to 30 days worth, that's tons and tons, uh, of, of this chlorine, which is harmful to them. So it's definitely okay at the customer tap level, you're not gonna have a chlorine gas leak there, but at the water treatment works level, it's something that could be really harmful for people. Um, and another example of a chemical with uh, um, an unintended consequence, shall we say, is phosphate. Um, so when I'm saying phosphate, I'm actually meaning also phosphoric acid. Um, so we dose this at water treatment works to protect against lead pipes in the pipe networks. Um, so around 40% of households in the UK actually have lead somewhere as part of their, their pipes or with their fittings and fixtures. So your taps, your solder might be lead, um, which is a big problem because lead toxicity is, is there and it's, it's a problem. Um, particularly uh, lead is well studied for behavioural problems in children, reduced IQ, those kinds of things. But it actually accumulates in your body during the course of your lifetime. So it can cause 
death in high enough doses, it can cause um, central nervous system failure, it can cause a lot of problems. Um, so we dose this phosphate to stop that happening. It sort of coats the inside of these lead pipes, so the lead can't sort of fall off, um, precipitate, come into the water and then come into your customer tap. Um, but the problem with this is phosphate, some, some researchers say, is going to be running out in the next 50 to 100 years. So in 50 years time, we've not really got anything at the moment. We've not started, we've not got rid of our lead. We're just using phosphate as a chemical in the meantime to just help us cope. So, you know, we, if, we got, if we didn't have that phosphate there, that buffer, maybe we would have removed all of our lead by now. Um, regulations changed in the 1970s regarding lead and water usage. Um, so that's just one of the problems um, with using uh, some of these chemicals today. So what chemicals are we using to treat water? Um, so I want you to get a piece of paper and write this down or put it in the chat if you're feeling particularly brave. I want you to have a think about how long do you think it takes for water to get from a water treatment works to your customer tap, to your tap in your kitchen. So yeah, write it down, put it in the chat if you're feeling brave, you know, give me your best guess. Are we talking minutes? Are we talking hours? Are we talking days? Weeks? Just think about what you, you think the answer to that is for that transportation of the water. Remember, like visualize the amount of pipes that we'd have to have to go on this journey as you're as you're thinking this through. Okay. I am going to give you the answer now. So quickly write it down or you'll be cheating. OK, so the answer actually is for the UK. Um, it's, you're looking at an average of three days. Um, so we're definitely talking days here. Um, but the, the extremes of the network, it can actually in this country be up to 10 days. So just in the east where I live, we've actually got enough drinking water pipes to go to the moon from the Earth and then back again. That is a lot of pipes in our ground. So when I say that 40% of households contain lead pipes, that's why. Um, so there's a lot of this pipe, some of it is super old, some of it's like Victorian era pipe. Um, so when I was doing this research and I was looking into these chemicals that we're dosing, I decided to really focus down on the chemicals that we're dosing specifically to try and protect the water on this massive long journey in the pipes. Um, so this isn't the chemicals that are used at the water treatment works, but those ones that are dosed specifically to protect it from the water treatment works to the tap, because like I said, it's a really, really long journey. Um, so particularly I was focusing on chlorine and phosphate that I was just discussing a second ago. So how did I actually investigate this? Um, so I built these five fake pipe networks and fake customer taps. Um, so if you imagine it, a shipping container, you would walk into this shipping container, 20 foot standard shipping container. On the left hand side wall, there would be a wall of pipe. And on the right hand side wall, there would be a wall of pipe. All of the pipes on the left had these chemicals in, had chlorine in, had phosphate in. All those chemicals on the right didn't have these chemicals in. So they were completely separate pipe loops. And don't worry, I wasn't trying to give anyone this water to drink. This was all running to waste. But yeah, two separate um, independent pipe loops that had these different chemicals in. So I was able to compare these two. And I actually had two of these shipping containers. One of them was on a surface water site. So that means that this is sort of like uh, river water or like a reservoir. That's where the water is coming from for that water treatment works. And then I had another shipping container on a site that was groundwater in source. So that means it's like a borehole. It's like a well in source. It's being um, pumped up from deep, deep within the ground. So, yeah, I had four of these separate pipe systems, four loops of pipe all together, but two shipping containers. Um, and the reason why I made my own pipe was because I was interested in what was happening with the water quality of the water running through the pipes themselves. Uh, but I was actually really interested as well as what was growing on the pipe walls. Um, so for that, I had to have my own pipes. Um, so I designed these, these pipes and they had removable pipe sections that I called coupons. So really, really high level um, technique here. You take the bit of pipe wall out with trying, trying not to get too much water leaving the rigs at the same time because I was aiming for a residency time of three days. And um, so you take this section of pipe out, then you get this very high tech bit of kit called a toothbrush. You use the toothbrush to scrape the material off the coupon, and then you would analyze that um, to see what was growing on the pipe wall as well as what was going inside it. So I'm going to wish you back up to the top now. 
So that's how the trial progressed. These were based completely on the water treatment works. And I was essentially looking at who is there. So I was using plate counts, mostly for E. coli. I was looking at how much is there. So I was looking at using a machine called flotatometer, um, which is basically using lasers to count individual numbers of cells. So I was looking at the total cell count and the intact cell count both on the water running through the wig, wig and the biofilm growing on the, the surface of the wig as well. And then most of the analysis that I was doing was sort of what has the potential to be there, looking at lots of different nutrients and wider parameters, the, the water chemistry, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I was mostly interested in phosphate, um, different, different types of phosphate and some of the different nutrients that are present there. So what were the key findings of my work? Well, uh, it really surprised me actually. So comparing these four different experimental conditions, shall we say, I was really expecting there to be a massive deterioration in water quality when we stopped dosing these chemicals. But actually of the four rigs, the biggest difference there wasn't if chemicals were or were not used. The biggest difference was actually based on whether the site was fed by surface water or if it was fed by groundwater. So even uh, when we got rid of the, the chemicals at these sites, there wasn't all that much difference, particularly at the groundwater site. The groundwater site was really good quality going into these pipe systems. So after three days circulating within them, even without the chemicals, it was really good. Same going in, same going out, I guess. Uh, and the chemicals didn't really do that much difference. Um, so that really surprised me. Um, and it really showed me that this choice of source water type was most important when deciding about the future of your water going forwards. Um, so that, that was really what I found and it did surprise me. I did expect that big deterioration when the chemicals were not used. Um, but it's also of concern for the future really because it, this, this research shows me that chemical free water is possible today because the water quality didn't deteriorate when we stopped dosing the chemicals. But in future, things like climate change, it's really going to influence that source water. Um, so it could be that this research is possible today, but in 50 years time, when source water has changed because of climate change, it, it might not be possible at all. Um, but right now, if assuming that doesn't happen, um, my research indicates that, yeah, we can do this and there's not going to be all that much difference if we do. So that's my research. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me today and seeing my presentation. Feel free to follow me on Twitter and get in touch. Uh, please, I'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Natalie. Our next speaker is Dr. David Negus with his presentation about predatory bacteria as living antibiotics. There we go. So um, I'll just briefly introduce myself uh, again, even though I've done it just briefly beforehand, but um, I'm, I'm Dr. David Negus and I'm a microbiologist at Nottingham Trent University. Um, specifically, I'm part of what we call the AROM group at Nottingham Trent University, which is our antimicrobial resistance omics and microbiota group. Um, for myself personally, as I mentioned before, I'm interested in developing new therapies for the treatment of antibiotic resistant infections. Um, and that has several areas that I'm interested in. Um, I mentioned bacteriophage before. I'm also interested in the use of what we call capsule depolymerases, which remove protect protective capsules from the surface of bacteria as a way of treating infections. But one of the other key areas of my research is the use of what we call predatory bacteria, um, which are bacteria which actually eat other bacteria as potential living antibiotics. So for today's talk, I'm gonna give you a very, very sort of brief high level overview um, about the potential use of predatory bacteria as living antibiotics with a bit of background about the organism especially as it may be new to, to some of you. And I'll talk you through a little bit about the current research and how, how much we know about the potential of using it as a living antibiotic. And the research I'm going to talk to you about will include some of my own, some of my previous research group, um, and also from other collaborators uh, around the world as, as well. So a little bit of background to sort of kickstart, even though I'm sure many of you are all aware about the situation we face today. Um, we are in a pretty grim situation with regards to antimicrobial resistance. Um, and I've put together here just a very brief overview of some recent headlines that highlight some of the multi 
drug resistant pathogens that we're beginning to see um, causing real problems in, in hospitals all over the UK. So especially for hospital acquired in, in infections. Um, and in a lot of these pathogens, we're not only seeing multi-drug resistance, but in some of them, we're beginning to see extended drug resistance or sometimes even pan drug resistance, which we often call total drug resistance, especially with um, some pathogens like tuberculosis, for example. Um, we're estimating that, you know, typically AMR bacteria infect about 2 million people. That's in the US alone each year, you know, of which about 23,000 of those infections will go on to, to be fatal in infections, unfortunately. And we are really beginning to see a particular issue with gram negative bacteria, um, which cause uh, severe bacteremia. So things like that go on to cause things like sepsis, for example, which we've already had an excellent talk about um, today. So like I said, just a selection of some of the headlines here, things like um, totally drug resistant TB emerging in, in places like India and other areas as well. Super gonorrhea, um, which has become a particular problem here in the UK. Um, in the US, there was a, a woman who died from an infection that was completely drug resistant to all of the antibiotics that were available in the hospital. Um, I believe that was an asymptomatic Baumannii infection, but they, they tested it against about 23 different drugs that were available at the hospital, and it had high level resistance to all of the antibiotics it was tested against. And unfortunately, we're now also beginning to see high levels of resistance against some of our last line antibiotics. So agents like colistin, for example, which although it is an old drug, you're talking about it being discovered sort of 60 years ago now, it was originally taken off the market because it was deemed too toxic. It was dangerous, particularly towards the kidneys. Um, but we are now having to resort to use these drugs because we literally have nothing else left. Um, but even these drugs are beginning to fail us now as bacteria become more and more resistant to them. So we're in a pretty grim situation. So my research, as I mentioned before, is really focused on developing new treatments for these drug resistant infections, um, in particular ones which aren't based on traditional antibiotic chemotherapy, uh, with the hope that these sort of new treatment options or these novel modalities will be effective against these existing antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria or newly emerging antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria. And one particular research area that I'm active in is the potential use of what we call predatory bacteria um, as potentially living antibiotics. Um, and the pred predatory bacteria that I'm particularly interested in is called Delavibrio bacteria vorus. Um, and you can see it on the slide here. Um, this is an electron micrograph of the organism here. It has this typical what we call um, vibroid shape. Often we refer to it as a jelly bean shape. It has this typical jelly bean shape and this long monotrichus flagellum, um, which it uses to propel itself at high speeds. It's an exceptionally fast swimmer, one of the fastest swimmers in, in the microbial world. Um, so a couple of key facts about Delavibrio bacteria vorus for those of you who maybe haven't come across it before. It was first isolated in 1962 by two scientists called Stolp and Petzold. So it's a fairly new um, microbe, so to speak, although it's always been there. We only discovered it sort of 60, 60, 70 years ago. As I already mentioned, it is a predatory bacterium. Um, and that means that the only way that it can actually replicate is by infecting um, other bacteria, and it only preys on and infects other gram-negative bacteria. And it is a gram-negative bacterium itself. That's the only way that it can replicate by infecting other gram-negative bacteria and replicating within the periplasm of those bacteria. So it's an obligate intracellular parasite, essentially. Now, even though it's a gram-negative bacterium itself and it preys on other gram-negative bacteria, it doesn't actually cannibalize other Delavibrio cells. So it has some kind of self-recognition system in place uh, that we don't fully understand yet. We don't know exactly how it manages to differentiate itself from other gram-negative bacteria. But with it being a predatory bacteria and with it being able to prey on a number of drug-resistant important pathogens, there is the scope and the potential to hopefully develop it as this sort of living antibiotic that we could use to treat um, really serious gram-negative um, drug-resistant infections. And that's really what my research looks at. So I'm going to start with a little bit of information about how exactly it does prey on other gram-negative bacteria. And this figure here will give a bit of an explanation of the predatory cycle of Delavibrio. So Delavibrio has what we call a, a biphasic lifestyle. 
It has a free swimming attack phase where the organism is hunting or looking for its prey. And during that period, it's not dividing, so it's not growing. And the second phase is the growth phase, which occurs within a prey cell. So once it's identified a prey cell, where it actually begins to replicate. And this figure here just shows you an overview of, of that. So we have a look in a little bit more detail. The, in the yellow here with this jelly bean sort of morphology, this is Delavibrio, the predator. And this green shaped um, rod here could be any other gram negative bacteria, which would be a suitable prey cell essentially. So in the first sort of phase of its life cycle, which we call the attack phase, Delavibrio is swimming along at extremely high speeds, hoping to bump into a, a suitable prey cell. Now, when it does that, it undergoes a period of what we call non-specific transient attachment, where it's essentially determining whether or not it's found a suitable prey cell. So has it found another gram-negative bacteria that it could potentially eat? If it decides that it has found a suitable prey cell, so another gram-negative bacteria, it begins the process of invasion. And at this point, this is a non-reversible step of the, the life cycle. So it commits to predation, essentially. And what it, what it does now is it pulls itself across the gram-negative outer membrane, and it uses a type 4 a pillus, a bit like a grappling hook, so it's essentially. So it comes out from the front of the organism. It uses it um, to attach to the inner membrane of gram-negative bacteria, and then it retracts the pillus, pulling itself into the periplasm of the prey cell. So when it's in the periplasm of the prey cell, as you can see in in um, this part of the diagram here, it settles in the periplasm, it reseals the hole that it made on the way in, ensuring that none of the nutrients actually escape. So it, it makes sure that it has a, a good dinner for itself, essentially, and it also stops super infection by other Della Vibrio um, getting in. And it begins to actually remodel the prey cell at this point. So the prey cell goes from a rod shape here to this circular structure here, and we call this the delaplast. Now, at this point, when it's remodeled the prey cell into a delaplast, the cell is dead. The prey cell is dead at this point. So electron transport stops. And what delavibrio then begins to do is release a arsenal of diffusible enzymes um, into the cytoplasm, which breaks down macromolecules like DNA, RNA, etc., into metabolizable fragments, which it then uses to enter a period of growth. And Delavibrio is very different to most organisms. It doesn't divide by binary fission. Instead, it grows as a long filament. So you can see that here, um, a bit like a sausage shape within the prey cell. And it continues to grow until it exhausts all of the prey resources. At that point, it can sense that the um, resources have been exhausted and it undergoes a what we call a synchronous septation event. So it is able to measure exactly how long uh, a filament it's um, produced and how many chromosomes it's produced and it filaments itself into a number of daughter cells uh, dependent on the number of, of chromosomes that it's produced. At that point the Della Vibrio is still within the prey cell um, and they use other enzymes to exit the prey cell including lysozymes so they burst the outside of the prey cell and what you have is the release of new um, Della Vibrio predators in attack phase, so highly motile swimming predators, which essentially swim off to find their next victim. Um, this whole process from sort of attachment to exit will take about three to four hours within the lab in under typical conditions. And the number of progeny that you get released, so the number of new Della Vibrio released, is typically dependent on the size of the prey cell to start with. So the larger the prey, the more resources that are available for growth and the larger the number of progeny which are released at the end of the process. So that is sort of the cartoon overview of it, but I think it's much cooler to actually see it in action. So these are a couple of videos that I took in the lab showing you some of the key like or some of the key stages of the predatory cycle um, of both entry and exit. So I'm going to play these for you and just sort of explain what's going on. So we'll start with entry. I'll get it to start. I'm just going to stop it to begin with to explain what you can see here. So the larger dark cells here, the rod-shaped organisms, these are prey cells. In this particular example, the prey cells we were using were drug-resistant isolates of serratia marcescens, so an important nosocomial pathogen. And then the smaller, more motile organisms that you can see attached to the outside of the prey cell here, which have that jelly bean morphology that I mentioned, these are the Della Vibrio predators here. Now, when I hit play, I think the best example to watch is this one that I'm circling here. So this is a prey cell. 
and this is a Della Vibrio Predator attached to the outside of it. When I press play, what you'll see is this Della Vibrio enter the prey cell, and then you'll see the prey cell change shape from this rod-like structure to that circular Della Plast that we mentioned before that has the Della Vibrio inside it beginning to replicate. So I'm just gonna press play now. So keep your eyes on this one, and you hopefully can see it there. It entered the prey cell, and now that prey cell has become a Della Plast, so it's circularized as opposed to these ones, which are still rod-like, which haven't been infected. So just in case you missed it, I'm gonna wait till that finishes. I'm just gonna press play one more time. So keep your eyes on this one here, and you should see it go into the prey cell there, and it remodels the prey cell into the Delaplast. At that point, the prey cell is dead. Now, the other part of the process that I'm gonna show you very quickly is exit. So what you see on the video here is a number of prey cells which have already been infected with Della Vibrio, hence why they're now round, these are Della Plasts. So these have Della Vibrio inside them, actively growing and dividing. And when I press play, what you'll see is the last stage, exit. You will see the prey cell become more and more translucent as the predators within them begin to break down um, the, the cell wall, and eventually you'll see them exit from the, from the prey cell. So if I press play, Oh, and I'm going to hope that this actually does play. Well, if I do get it working, oh, is it going to play? Sometimes it, it's extremely poor resolution. So there we go. So hopefully what you'll begin to see with this example here was that started as a, as a typical prey cell. What you can begin to see is the individual outline of a number of Della Vibrio from within that prey cell and these are the new progeny, which eventually will be released from the prey cell. I'll just try playing it again, there we go. So this time it started properly. You can see the prey cell is intact here, and eventually you'll see it become more translucent, and you'll begin to see the shape of individual Della Vibrio emerging. So you can see them there, and eventually they will swim off from within the prey cell, ready to infect new bacteria. So that's two of the major sort of steps of the Della Vibrio life cycle. And I think it just helps us to see those actually in action. So my research, like I mentioned, is really about can we use these as a potential treatment or as living antibiotics, as we like to term them. Um, but before we do that, just like any drug that we want to bring to the clinic, um, there are a number of factors which we need to understand in detail before we can start putting these into a patient. And some of those factors include things like safety. So can we safely put them into a person? Um, their prey range, so which bacteria can they eat and therefore which types of infections could you use them to treat? Their delivery, so what's the best way to actually get them into a person? The dose, so how many do you have to give and how often do you have to give them? Will they actually work in immune environments? So for example, in places like human serum, which also have antibacterial action. Um, these are bacteria themselves. Will they be able to withstand that for a long enough time period to actually act on the other bacteria which are there? And lastly, does any resistance occur to bacterial predation, just like we see resistance to antibiotics? So now I'm gonna take you through a little bit about what we know with relation to some of these key aspects to using them as a potential living antibiotic. So I'm gonna start with safety. Um, and understandably, people normally always have questions over using these um, safely in humans because we're proposing to put a living organism into a person. And on top of that, Della Vibrio bacteria vorus itself is a gram negative bacterium. Um, and we've already had a talk about sepsis today and gram negative bacteria in particular typically cause severe inflammatory responses in people, particularly if they get into the bloodstream um, and that can then lead to sepsis. Um, and with gram negative bacteria, one of the major contributing factors to sepsis is the presence of LPS or lipopolysaccharide, um, which is a major component of the gram negative outer membrane. And lipopolysaccharide causes or mostly causes inflammation in humans because it interacts with toll-like receptors on human cells, specifically toll-like receptor 5. Um, um, more specifically, that interaction occurs because the lipid A section down here of LPS has these phosphate residues attached to it. And those phosphate residues carry a negative charge. And that negative charge helps the lipid A to interact with the toll-like receptors. And then that sets off this massive inflammatory response going essentially. Now, 
although Delavibrio is a gram-negative bacterium itself and it does have LPS and lipid A, its lipid A is very different to what we typically find in most gram-negative bacteria. So this is a sort of zoomed in version of the lipid A in, in Delavibrio bacteria vorus. And instead of those phosphate groups that you typically have in gram-negative bacteria, Delavibrio has mannose groups attached to its lipid A. And mannose groups have a neutral charge, which means that they do not interact with toll-like receptors like typical lipid A does. And that means that it does not invoke a strong inflammatory immune response like most gram-negative bacteria. So we should be able to give these to people without setting off things like sepsis, for example, um, and a strong inflammatory immune response. So that's one major safety factor that Delavibrio has going for it. So it has monosylated lipid A. We have seen through numerous studies that Delavibrio also does not invade any human cell lines that they've been tested with. There have been a number of safety studies in various different animals, and we have never seen ill effects in any of the animals that have been dosed with Delavibrio. And also because it's an obligate predator, without bacteria being present for it to prey on, it does not replicate. So once it's killed its prey, it stops replicating and it should be able to be cleared by the host immune system essentially. So what about prey range? What type of bacterial infections could we potentially treat using Delavibrio? Well, there have been a number of studies looking at that. And the good news is, is that Delavibrio eats pretty much all gram-negative bacteria that you put in front of it. So from this study here, which looked at what type of gram-negative bacteria Delavibrio could eat, if there is a plus next to the name, it means that Delavibrio would happily eat it. So a wide range of important human pathogens, things like Acinetobacter, for example, things like Klebsiella um, and Shigella as well, for example. So a wide range of different human pathogens, Delavibrio is very happy to eat, including drug resistant um, isolates of these pathogens too, which is important. Now, those results that I showed you about the prey range of Delavibrio were all performed in vitro. So outside of a, a living being, and they are fairly meaningless if Delavibrio doesn't work in vivo, so inside either an animal or within a human where you would actually find an infection. So I'm just going to briefly run through now a couple of examples of where people have attempted to use Delavibrio as a therapeutic in vivo. Now, probably the first well-publicized study of doing this was in 2011 from Prof Professor Socket's lab at the University of Nottingham, of which I used to be a member. And in that study, um, they were able to show that the oral administration of Delavibrio um, to chickens infected with salmonella reduced both the presence of salmonella in the chickens and also the symptoms associated with salmonella infection. So that was a really important first study. Then in 2016, a group from the United States were able to show that intranasal administration of Delavibrio was able to reduce um, the burden of Klebsiella pneumoniae in rat lungs. Uh, so another important pathogen there, Klebsiella pneumoniae. And then 2016, a really, really important study was published, which actually showed the first, or it was the first study to show that Delavibrio could rescue animals from an otherwise lethal infection. So again, this study was performed by Professor Socket's group at the University of Nottingham in collaboration with their partners at Imperial College London. And what they were able to show was that they took zebrafish and they infected them with otherwise lethal Shigella infections, and then they treated them with injections of Delavibrio, and they found that those injections of Delavibrio prevented death in the zebrafish. So just very quickly, these are actual results from the experiments here. This left-hand panel here, what you see is the outline of a zebrafish head at various time points following infection with Shigella, and the Shigella have been tagged with green fluorescent protein. And what you'll see is that as time goes on, that infection gets worse and worse in the zebrafish, which have received the sham treatment of PBS. But in the zebrafish, which have also received an injection of Delavibrio, what you see is as time goes on, the infection is gradually cleared. So there's a reduction in that green fluorescent protein of the Shigella as the Delavibrio prey on the Shigella in the zebrafish. And lastly, just to finish off, um, one of the last research areas that I'm interested in is actually combining Delavibrio with antibiotics, because although Delavibrio are great, um, they only work on gram-negative bacteria, and many infections are actually caused by a mixture of both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. In particular, wound infections are typically polymicrobial infections. So one of the things I'm looking at is, can we combine Delavibrio with specific antibiotics, with the idea being that the Delavibrio will kill gram-negative bacteria, and the specific antibiotics will kill gram-positive bacteria? And in some of the preliminary results here on the graph here, 
what you can see are results of those experiments where we have used um, gram-positive specific antibiotics like daptomycin to kill a gram-positive organism, Staph Staphylococcus epidermidis, and we've used Delavibrio to kill a gram-negative important organism, Serratia marcescens. So this was combining those two organisms together in the presence of both Delavibrio and an antibiotic. So that shows us that we do have the potential to treat these polymicrobial mixed infections by combining Delavibrio with gram-positive specific antibiotics. And what you can see is that at the beginning here, we have high levels of both pathogens, but by about eight hours after combining Delavibrio with the antibiotics, we managed to reduce um, the burden of the infection by several uh, log units. And what we're now looking at is taking those results forward and seeing if we can get similar results in animal models. So can we save animals from polymicrobial infections, essentially? Uh, so to wrap up, um, a little bit about some of the future directions that we might be looking at with Delavibrio. Um, there is no genetic resistance to Delavibrio that we know of. Um, so there are no mutations that bacteria can pick up to give them long-lasting resistance to Delavibrio predation, but there is something called phenotypic or plastic resistance that occurs, and that is something that we need to understand in more detail before we can use these as therapeutics. I'm also interested in developing better predators, so to speak. So most studies that have been performed have been using the same two lab strains of Delavibrio, but without a doubt, there are other strains of Delavibrio out there in the environment, which may be better predators or better suited to predation in immune environments. I'm also interested in combination therapies. So like I said, combining Delavibrio with other therapeutic agents, including antibiotics. Also interested in could we use components of Delavibrio, so some of their enzymes, for example, as standalone therapeutics rather than using the whole organisms themselves. And I'm also quite interested in the potential of using Delavibrio to modulate um, the microbiota, particularly in the gut in diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, for example. So that's an ongoing area of research. So I'll stop there before I go too far over because I could talk about this all day and all night. Um, but I'm very happy to take questions from, from people if you have any questions. So our next speaker is he's from Russian Federation, Georgi Kurakin. He is from Tver State Medical University. And his poster is about do bacteria and protozoa communicate with, with oxylipins? Mm, I am glad to greet all participants, all yeah. organizers, and all uh, experts of the judging panel. Uh, I am Georgi Kurakin. I uh, am the postgraduate stu student in Tver State Medical University. Uh, here uh, you can see my poster that was submitted to the first stage of the uh, competition. Uh, but I would like to present a slideshow uh, for a more comprehensive uh, overview of, my, of our work. Uh, to begin, uh, I note that I write about oxalipines, but I have uh, drawn only two oxalipines at the poster and only as decorative elements. Here, I am recompensing this deficiency. Here you can see hypoxylene and chasmonate uh, that are drawn at the head of the poster and well-known prostaglandin and leukotriene uh, that uh, are human eicosanoids and the mediators of inflammation. Uh, these compounds, prostaglandins and leukotrienes are chemical teeth of intraid cell. When uh, something damages our cells, uh, our cells re release these compounds, and it is a chemical cry for help from our uh, from the cells. Uh, this crying for help uh, attracts leukocytes uh, and initiates uh, the innate immune response uh, that we know as inflammation. Plants, plants uh, do not develop inflammation, but uh, their stress reactions uh, are coordinated uh, with similar oxalipines, and uh, plant cells uh, also cry for help with oxalipines being injured, damaged, or stressed. And it appears that uh, in different kingdoms of, of eukaryotes, uh, evolutionary distant kingdoms, oxalipines uh, play similar roles. 
in cell-to-cell -cell signaling. Uh, this similarity stretches uh, across uh, all eukaryotic kingdoms. For example, uh, fungi use oxylipines as uh, quorum sensing and popular uh, population density sensing molecules. Brown algae and diatom algae uh, use them as pheromones. And uh, almost all multicellular eukaryotes use them for cell-to-cell -cell signaling. It is a, stri a striking similarity. It is the most interesting that in all of these kingdoms, lipoxygenase enzyme is involved in oxalipine biosynthesis. It uh, has very conserved structure and is very useful to track uh, oxalipine by uh, evolu oxalipine evolution. Uh, the most simple explanation of this similarity is that uh, lipoxygenases and oxalipin signaling descended from the common ancestor of all eukaryotes. But let's uh, look at this tree. I, uh, I can show that uh, we have information about oxalipin functions only in two groups of eukaryotes, opistoconts and ecoplastids. And if I paint out all other groups, we could see that we know almost nothing about lipoxygenase evolution in eukaryotes. Our knowledge about uh, lipoxygenase and oxalipin functions in bacteria is more poor. We know that uh, a small percentage of bacteria has lipoxygenase, but we don't know do bacteria and protozoa communicate with oxalipins like eukaryotes? Uh, the good news is that bioinformatic methods could help in this case. And here starts our research. Uh, the main idea of our research was to use lipoxygenase protein sequences from biological database uh, as a tracking sign or tracking mark for oxalipin signaling evolution. We use simple statistical analysis and phylogenetic analysis in forms uh, of use, uh, usual phylogenetic trees and phylogenetic networks. The results of statistical analysis uh, have, have shown that um, the lipoxygenase occurrence is extremely high in texts uh, showing multicellular morphology. I uh, speak now about bacteria, but you have understood right. Multicellular bacteria do exist. Mixococcalus Mixobacteria uh, that was mentioned by, by David Nigus are uh, predatory bacteria, but they form multicellular fruiting bodies. Uh, cyanobacteria uh, can, uh, can form uh, long fi filaments and even differentiate in three cell types. And all of these uh, texts, all of these orders show an extremely uh, high lipoxygenase occurrence. The same picture we can see uh, in the case of protozoa. Uh, the extremely high occurrence of lipoxygenase is observed in slime molds and in water molds or omicets. It seems that lipoxygenases are associated with multicellularity in bacteria and protozoa, but we need phylogenetic reconstructions to obtain additional information. In our article, you, uh, could, uh, you could see uh, more detailed uh, computation and reconstructions. And here I, uh, I show all our reconstructions in one picture. This picture you could uh, see in the middle of our poster. Uh, in our phylogenetic networks, uh, two associations of lipoxygenases are clearly visible. Uh, blue circles indicate uh, groups that show multicellular morphology, morphology and orange circles show groups uh, that are pathogenic, uh, that are nosocomial pathogens or uh, opportunistic pathogens. Uh, 
as we can see, the uh, most uh, sector of this phylogenetic uh, network is occupied by multicellular bacteria. And it is a graphical outline of association uh, between lipoxygenases and multicellularity that we have revealed. Uh, we have reconstructed uh, horizontal gene transfers uh, when it was possible. Our constructions show that lipoxygenases originated in cyanobacteria and then was transferred to mixobacteria, other groups of multicellular bacteria, and uh, to different groups of eukaryotes at uh, evolutionary moments when they acquired multicellularity. And it shows that lipoxygenases are associated with multicellularity and uh, leads to an assumption that lipoxygenases and toxilipines uh, could contribute to the origins of multicellularity and be the most ancient cell to cell signaling molecules. Let's uh, speak a little about the second association. Uh, here you can see a cluster of um, pathogenic bacteria with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, also mentioned today, in the center of this cluster. Uh, the lipoxygenase or Pseudomonas aeruginosa is experimentally characterized by other authors. And uh, here I can present a picture uh, how it uh, uh, the, uh, how it the, um, how it suppresses our immunity and generates a false uh, attack over signal by oxalipine signaling. Uh, our um, our research shows that uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa are if not alone. Uh, some other groups of bacteria. Uh, of pathogenic bacteria could use lipoxygenase this way. It is a short black list of these evil makers and it is incom incomplete now. Uh, many of them are emerging nosocomial pathogens and antibiotic resistance pathogens and it uh, demands uh, critical attention from uh, medical specialists. Uh, we also expanded uh, the assumption that lipoxygenases in some bacteria uh, can um, participate in uh, vi virulence and pathogenases uh, by revealing new common trait of these bacteria. Uh, they, they are able to uh, cross kingdom virulence and uh, rapid cross kingdom host jumps. And uh, here at this picture that you could see at the poster, we reconstructed uh, a hypothetical uh, communication uh, that uh, could uh, occur between these bacteria and plant or human uh, cells. And uh, we have drawn uh, two main conclusions. Uh, Bacteria and protozoa do communicate with oxalipines, particularly multicellular bacteria, probably cyanobacteria, communica communicated with oxalipines long before the emergence of eukaryotes. Uh, eukaryotes have borrowed this function by horizontal gene transfer. And uh, some bacteria have learned to use oxalipines for rear earlings, but uh, the, this function uh, is secondary in the evolutionary time scale. Addi uh, additional information about our research you can find in our article in the Journal Biochemistry Moscow. Here you can see some links uh, to, obti to obtain this article, including a free full text link uh, that I have also shared in the meeting chat. Uh, we have also written a popular article for Laboratory News Magazine, where we speculated about uh, develop, developing new antibiotics basing on knowledge that microbial lipoxygenases are involved in virulence. 
Uh, and uh, here I uh, would like to show some follow-ups of our research. Um, our uh, reconstructions of evolutionary pathway, pathway of uh, lipoxygenases is strikingly similar uh, with reconstructions of uh, evolutionary pathway of metacostases and other proteins of programmed uh, cell death. The both groups of proteins have originated in cyanobacteria and made a very thorny way with horizontal gene transfers to eukaryotes. And uh, the both groups of proteins uh, are associated with multicellularity. And we need to investigate it is an accidental similarity or it is an evolutionary link and it is the topic of our further research. Uh, we could uh, think that it is accident an accidental similarity uh, and it is not needed to investigate it. But, uh, but uh, in our article, we couldn't explain why uh, the coccolita for Emiliania Huxley has lipoxygenase. We have identified a lipoxygenase in its proton, but we could not explain why. But later we knew about Nick Lane's article, and uh, now uh, we could explain uh, this uh, finding uh, by the fact that Emiliania Huxley has a programmed cell death, a feature uh, shared by uh, many multicellular organisms. And uh, it shows that uh, similarity between evolution of lipoxygenases and oxylipin signaling and uh, programmed cell death needs uh, a further investigation. After this presentation, uh, you uh, maybe uh, wish uh, to take a second look at our poster and it is not needed to seek it in Twitter or in Instagram. I have posted in, in ResearchGate and assigned a DOI for, uh, for, for it. And uh, this link uh, is shared uh, in the meeting chat also. It's time to say thanks uh, to all for images, uh, for image courtesy, and present our research, research, research team and our contact information. I wait for your questions. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we have a last speaker, uh, Dr. Alice Murthy, she is a research fellow at Nottingham Trent University and she has a talk in about broccoli extract as a potential treatment for obesity mediated type 2 diabetes. Okay, so yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Alice Murphy, I'm from Nottingham Trent University um, and I've been studying how a broccoli extract might um, help in the, the treatment or um, prevention of type 2 diabetes in obese uh, subjects. Um, so a bit of background, there's been a lot of um, interest in broccoli and how it might reduce or prevent um, the risk of getting cancer. Um, there's actually broccoli that are on sale at the moment that are sold as, you know, eat this and it will reduce your risk of developing prostate cancer. And it's also been shown that a diet rich in um, this high glucoraphane in broccoli can reduce the level of LDL cholesterol within the blood. So we, um, you know, we wanted to see how this might translate to diabetes. And also, um, so there have been studies just to, to demonstrate this within cancer, where mice were fed um, either a control diet or a high fat Western diet, either with or without um, this broccoli powder. Um, they were then treated with either saline or DEN, which is a carcinogen. And what it showed was that um, those that had broccoli in their diet had a reduced level of um, ALT, which is an indicator of liver damage, and it also prevented um, lesions which can progress to cancer. So you can see down the bottom here, there are lesions in those ones um, treated with the carcinogen, but when broccoli was included in that treatment, they were really reduced. 
And similarly over here, you've got um, the levels of ALT um, were really reduced when broccoli was included within that treatment. So um, we're actually in the middle of a clinical study. Unfortunately, it's been put on hold due to COVID at the moment, but um, we've, we've gathered some samples so far. Um, and what we've done is we've, we've recruited patients um, that are obese. We've uh, taken uh, both urine and blood samples, and then we've given them either a broccoli powder for four weeks or a pea powder as a placebo for four weeks. Um, and then they get a two week sort of flush out once we've taken those samples and then they go on the, the other kind of powder for four weeks and then we take more samples and we just look to see how those um, samples might have changed over time. And what we're looking at within those samples, we're looking at um, the lipid profile, the HbA1c just to see their diabetic status. Um, how their inflammation might have changed, their insulin levels, and also lipopolysaccharide, um, which can induce inflammation. That's something that we're particularly interested in in our group. Um, the urine samples, we're going to look at volatile organic co compounds where, where they um, slowly heat the urine. Uh, sounds lovely, I know. And um, then measure with mass spectrometry, the uh, the different volatile organic compounds that come off, and you, you can look at a profile and how that might differ between those that have had the broccoli treatment and those that haven't. Um, so a bit of the cellular background. So um, adipocytes or fat cells, they become really stressed and overwhelmed during obesity, um, as you can see by the little red cells there. Um, and they get a, a cycle of inflammation and endoplasmic reticulum stress and uh, reactive oxygen species that cause a lot of cellular damage uh, or dysfunction within, within the adipocytes. And this can actually lead to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. And actually 10% of the NHS budget is currently spent on diabetes, which is 1.5 million pounds per hour. So it's a lot of money. So if we can reduce that a bit, I think uh, it's obviously a good idea. Um, so I'm particularly interested in that endoplasmic reticulum stress pathway. Um, so usually, as I'm sure you know, the ER is um, tasked with folding the proteins correctly and you know getting them out to where they need to be. But what happens in obesity is that there's much more nutrients um, being through the cell and more and more proteins are required to be folded. And what happens is it gets really overwhelmed. And BIP, which is this sort of yellow circle here, um, is a chaperone. And what happens is in, in a healthy state, it's usually back to these three sensor proteins. But in an unhealthy obese state, when there's lots of proteins going through that need to be folded, BIP moves away to help to fold those proteins. And that actually activates these three sensor proteins, which causes this ER stress pathway. Um, at the end of this pathway, what happens is there's an increase in the number of chaperones being produced to help fold those proteins. There's a decrease in the general protein production to try and reduce the stress on the ER. But there's also an increase in inflammatory proteins. If this happens um, acutely, um, it does the job and it reduces the ER stress. But if it happens um, chronically, as it does in obesity, it can actually lead to insulin resistance um, due to the increased inflammatory proteins. So this is the pathway I wanted to study. And what I did was um, grow some human adipocytes. I then treated some with um, tunicomyosin here to induce this um, ER stress. I treated some with a broccoli extract, and then I treated some with both broccoli and tunicomycin together to see if broccoli might uh, reduce the impact of tunicomycin. Um, and then I looked at this over 72 hours. So I did a bit of optimization first, um, and what we can see is that um, the so we're looking at the um, genes that are in that ER stress pathway. One of the genes, CHOP, you can see that tunicomycin really does increase it over time. But even the low concentration of broccoli um, prevents that increase when it's um, combined with the tunicomycin treatment. Um, sometimes, as in this case, the broccoli seem to increase that stress, and we're not particularly sure why that is. Um, but we decided to go with the lower concentration of broccoli just so that um, it seems to have um, 
the same impact as the high concentration um, without causing too much damage in this area here. So I then sort of scaled up the experiment. Um, again, I looked at it over 72 hours and I took samples every six hours. Um, so that was sort of waking up in the middle of the night sometimes um, and did a, a whole lot of labeling, as you can see. Um, this is the broccoli extract here. So it's the bro it's freeze dried broccoli um, and then it's made into a powder. And then um, I extract it using ethanol and then treat the cells with that. So I decided to concentrate on one particular part of the ER stress pathway, um, the, par the part of it that actually um, prevents that general protein translation. So just to give you a quick uh, talk through that, so as BIP dissociates, it activates PERC, which then phosphorylates this protein here, and it's this phosphorylated um, EIF2 alpha that actually induces that translation attenuation, which is that process of you know, reducing the general amount of proteins that are produced. So I looked at these um, proteins, and what we found was that BIP, which is that chaperone at the start of the pathway, actually doesn't change very much with broccoli treatment at all, uh, which was a bit disappointing. But after some further sort of research, um, it was kind of shown that because BIP is that first, um, you know, almost sensor or gateway to the, the rest of the pathway, it's really tightly controlled. Um, so actually the fact that it doesn't change much with broccoli treatments um, isn't that surprising. But when we look at um, phospho EIF2 alpha and EIF2 alpha, you can see that actually the broccoli treatment uh, combined with the tuna chymiosin prevents that um, increase in um, protein expression that we can see here with tunicomycin. And again, you see that quite clearly with EIF2 alpha. Now, when we look at um, the relative expression, which is important when looking at phosphoproteins, um, you can see something really interesting, even just with the, the tunicomycin treatment, that it actually oscillates um, over time. So you can see it initially increases and then comes down and then increases again. And um, the reason that's interesting was that it, that was actually predicted by a mathematical model. Um, and the reason being that this is the part that initiates that um, translation attenuation. And the cells can cope with that for so long, but actually, you know, they need those um, proteins in order to function correctly. So what it does is it um, prevents translation until the cell can't cope with it, and then it decreases um, so that the cells are able to um, function with their protein production correctly and then if there's still stress it will then increase and so on um, until the stress has gone or the cell has died. And what we see with um, when we include broccoli in that treatment is that the very initial peak is kind of similar but actually it then decreases and delays the second peak and in general the peaks are much shorter lived um, over that time. So this is a just a kind of overview of that those results there. So a green cell indicates that broccoli extract has significantly reduced um, the expression of ER stress proteins, and the red cells are areas where um, broccoli extract has significantly increased it. Uh, a white cells mean that no, there's no significant um, change from broccoli extract. And so you can see that um, a lot of them are green, which is um, really interesting and hopeful really. So we looked at some of those other um, parts that are linked with ER stress. So we looked at ROS and we saw that there's a, um, there is a significant reduction in ROS when we include broccoli in that treatment at 24 hours. Um, but actually tunicomycin didn't seem to activate that ROS um, at any other time point. We also looked at um, mitochondrial function using the seahorse, um, which is really, really good machine, actually. Um, and so this, essentially, you add a compound at different times and it shuts down path, different parts of the mitochondrial pathway. And if we look at this middle bit here, that's indicative of um, mitochondrial respiration and how efficient that process is. So you can see at the top here, we've got broccoli, uh, we've got control, sorry, in blue and broccoli extracts in red, and they're very similar. Um, and then tunicomycin in green is right down here, so it really reduces that mitochondrial respiration. 
Um, when we add broccoli to that tunicomycin treatment, it prevents that drop being so dramatic. Um, so that's definitely an area that we're going to explore more in the future. So we also um, looked at some transcriptomics data and um, we found that broccoli was um, actually activating the mevalonate pathway and that was really interesting as well because um, tunicomycin is actually known to inhibit the mevalonate pathway so it's really interesting that they both sort of um, act on that same that same pathway and one of the outcomes of the mevalonate pathway is the production of coenzyme q10 now unfortunately, this does reduce er stress so that does makes sense as a as a pathway for broccoli to reduce ER stress. It also improves mitochondrial function, which we also saw, and it protects against weight gain. So that's a really interesting um, you know, mechanism or potential mechanism that again we're going to look into in more detail rather than just looking at the transcriptomics. We're also looking at um, a protein called WWP1. And again we're going back to the cancer link here where um, these researchers have found that WWP1 um, inhibits P10. Um, so you can see, so P10 is a tumor suppressor, um, which you can see there, and WWP1 is this evil protein that um, inhibits P10. And that means that the um, tumors can grow and multiply. And when these researchers um, looked at this uh, compound in broccoli called indole-3-carbonyl, they found that actually that suppresses WWP1, which allows P10 to um, activate and reduce the, the risk of increasing uh, cancer. So we thought, okay, does WWP1 have a role in diabetes? Then? We found out that actually, yes, it does. So it, it's known to promote um, the production of fat cells uh, and because of that it's more abundant in obese mice than lean mice. It also promotes muscle wastage during hyperglycemia and it blocks metformin induced glucose uptake. So metformin is a, a drug to control diabetes. You can see over here that um, you know normally metformin um, increases the glucose uptake but when um, cells uh, in rat muscles, skeletal muscle cells were transfected with WWP1, um, they actually decreased the amount of glucose that was being up, um, taken up by the cells. And um, equally, when there was uh, uh, no metformin present, it was also slightly lower as well. So um, we've just had a quick look at some data that we already had uh, from a different study where we had 10 lean patients and 10 obese patients. Um, we did some transcriptomics on them and we found just a quick snapshot that actually, yes, it is um, increased in obese humans, um, which replicates what they've seen in uh, rodents. So we want to look at this further and see um, how this changes with diabetes patients as well. Um, but this is um, just a really interesting start basically to the next um, stage of this project. So the take home message is that broccoli may reduce ER stress and therefore could also reduce insulin resistance and it may, activate, uh, may act through the mevalonate pathway or via WWP1. Um, and I'd like to obviously thank everybody in my team and those carrying out the, uh, the human study. Um, and I always like to share this picture of my mum's fridge <laughs> when I was doing the study um, and she, just constant broccoli. And it's nice to know that someone's, uh, you know, gunning for your research. So um, if anyone's got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If you have any questions on anything, please let us know. And thank you so much for all your time dedicated into this research poster competition.